everyone, I'm Sloan from SloanBella.com and I am back with another energetically channeled video. Now this one happened decades ago and hit the media in North America with a frenzy like no other. It had little bits of every single thing that parents worry about. I'm talking about the case of the West Memphis Three, which really should have been called the West Memphis Six because the three little eight-year-old boys that were missing and then found murdered and the three teenage boys that went to jail for the murders of the three eight-year-old boys and then the events that happened during after and are still happening as of recently so this is a case that goes back to may 5th of 1993 and we have little stevie branch michael moore and christopher Byer, three little buddies three eight-year-old little boys in this little town in West Memphis, Arkansas, considered a safe rural area. Parents, friends, neighbors, they all watched each other's kids. Kids would go in and out of people's houses. It was a community. Nobody was afraid. There were no cell phones. No one was locking their kids in. Most kids were on bikes and skateboards. As these kids, two on bikes, one on skateboards on that day, and they went up and down the street. Now, where it gets problematic is around 6.30 at night, they're not seen again. That's the last sighting of them between 6 and 6.30 at night. And nobody sees them. And so the family around 8, 9 o'clock at night, the families call the police. And there's an all-out search for these little boys. And they're looking for them everywhere. They're calling them because it's not like all three of them to go missing. There's always a clown in the bunch, but... Three little boys, none of them come home, none of them listen to their parents, none of them do their homework, that kind of thing. It's not going to happen. So everybody has a horrible feeling in the pit of their stomach. The moon is about to go full. We have events that are happening that are making people crazy. There's rumors, there's all kinds of things popping up. It wasn't until May 6th of 1993, the next day, approximately uh, early afternoon, 1.30ish, when the boys' bodies are found by somebody who is looking for them in the area of the Robin Hood Hills. It's called Robin Hood Hills. It is an area just walking distance from most of the houses in this little community, and it's covered by trees. It has a little stream going through the middle, creek by you, whatever, and it comes out through the other side closer to the interstate where a lot of transient traffic drives back and forth. So it's situated in a private kind of enclave because the trees are covering the area, because it's hidden. You don't have like a drive up kind of parking area. So people can actually walk, ride their bikes, skateboard there from anywhere in town and not get caught in there unless somebody is going to walk into the woods and specifically look for someone. So most people are not going to do that unless they have business in there. And what kind of business do little kids have in there? Well, little kids got business of building forts, climbing trees, smoking a cigarette, hiding their stash, wherever, their little kid stuff, doing that kind of thing, which I feel these three little boys did. So I'm going to talk about the three boys, Stevie Branch, Michael Moore, and Christopher Byer. I don't have times of birth for them, but I do have their birthdays. So I put Sun on the Ascendant and kind of briefly read around the energy. So we have Stevie Branch. We have him born November 26th of 1984. Sagittarius Sun, Uranus, and Mercury. We also have Saturn in Scorpio, which I found really interesting because all three boys had Saturn in Scorpio. And that, the night that they went missing, going into the morning that they went missing, the moon was going full in Scorpio. So really quite interesting. He also had Neptune, Jupiter, Venus, and his moon in the sign of Capricorn, and his Mars was in Aquarius. So we had two stelliums. Stellium, three or more planets in the same sign, even though the sun and moon are luminaries. I'm still counting them in this. So he had the Sag and the Capricorn stelliums. The personality was fun, playful, independent, intellectual, and just kiddish, like a kid, and fun and clownish and goofy, and then it was serious, like a Capricorn. So Steenie Branch was somebody who was independent, unique, paternal, 
and somebody who considered himself a leader and probably would have been slightly bossy just by his outward actions. But he was a typical all-American little boy and he was a lot of fun and he wouldn't have done anything that was really out of the, the ordinary for a kid of that age, okay? He just wouldn't have. He may have not responded the way that you want him to because the Sagittarius can be kind of goofy at certain things, but he was a normal kid. And then we have Michael Moore. Michael Moore was really happy to be the Boy Scout of the bunch. He loved his uniform and he loved to wear it. He also considered himself a leader, but they were two different kind of leaders. One was enjoying following the regiment and the rules that he could count on and know about. Now, Michael Moore's birthday was July 27th of 1984 in Key West, Florida. He had sun and Venus in Leo, and he had a sweet, sensitive moon in Cancer, Mercury in Virgo. Now, that was the most interesting part. I immediately go to that. Mercury in Virgo is where it should be, and it's lit up very psychically. So this kid would have had a good gut instinct. And because he was a Boy Scout and he enjoyed being an authority within the context of that, he wouldn't have allowed his friends to go astray. So it was either all of them together doing something where they could all keep an eye on each other or it wouldn't have been any of them. So I can pretty much tell from the energy of him that he would have corralled the other two boys if they were going to go off on their own. But from the energy I picked up, the three were in agreement with where they went, which leads me to believe that they had some kind of knowledge of the people around them who eventually ended up hurting them. So we have the Mercury in Virgo. We have Pluto in Libra for him at 29 degrees, a very auspicious degree. We have Saturn at nine degrees of Scorpio, roughly, I don't know his time of birth, as I said, and Mars in Scorpio. So there's a conjunction there. We also have with him South Node conjuncting Uranus. So that is very interesting. That's like a sudden unexpected event from the past popping up. Now, I don't take it as past life. I take it past in this life. That's just how my mind reads it real quick. And the last little boy was Christopher Beyer, and he's the one that stood out to me. Now, I've listened to the parents talk. He was respectful. He was quiet. Apparently, he came from an abusive home. But what I saw with his energy was literally he popped out. He's like, I'm telling like that, but with a smile on his face. So I immediately am drawn to the fact that Christopher Beyer saw something, had seen something, and had finally said, I'm going to say something. So this is more a crime of three kids walking up on something that they weren't supposed to see. Now, Christopher Beyer was born June 23rd of 1984 in Shelby, Tennessee. And he has his little sun and Mercury and Venus in Cancer. So comedic, funny, shy, Consider it, probably like to collect things because little cancer kids love to collect things. They love to collect things, whether it's like Pokemon cards or whatever. They love to do that kind of thing. He had, he also had Pluto at 29 degrees of Libra and we had Saturn and Mars in Scorpio and they were on top of each other combust. And I believe that is where the allegations of child abuse from his stepfather to him I think that that's probably where they came from. That would be a violent aspect within the home. He also has South Node and Sagittarius conjuncting Uranus. Now, here's where he fights. Moon in Aries, okay? So there were a lot of things that were conflicting with him in his chart, the way he presented himself at home and then the way he was outside. How was he outside with other people's family, parents, friends? Totally different kid totally different kid. Inside the home, he had to behave the way that he had to behave in order to preserve some modicum of peace in his life. Outside of the home, he was able to be himself. I'm pretty sure that this kid would have ended up kind of forging his own path and moving far, far away from that city that he was being raised in at the time of his passing. Now, 
This gets me to the other part of this story, which is just kind of interesting. Um, at the time, we had the McMartin case in the early 80s and then coming up on the early 80s to mid 80s and then coming up on this case in the 90s. And because the three teenage boys, which were Damian Eccles, Jason Baldwin, and Jesse Miss Kelly, were said through the grapevine to have been Satan practicing people, uh, especially Damien Eccles. Interesting, his name is Damien. Anyway, I'm sorry, I find that like a play on words. These three teenagers, 16, 17, and 18 respectively, were locked up for years in jail, contending that they were innocent, and eventually let go on an Alford plea in August of 2011. That kind of a plea does not say guilty or innocent. What it says is, we're going to let you make the plea to get out of jail in order to get your freedom. And in this case, it was to get Damien off of death row. He was the one of the three that was put in solitary confinement on death row for years. And taking the Alford plea allows them to get out of jail. They don't acknowledge that they're guilty but they don't acknowledge that they're innocent because the state will not continue testing the evidence that the state has against them. So it's kind of like a win-win for both sides. We don't have to use taxpayers' money to keep focusing on trying to find you guilty. We believe we can find you guilty, that the plea states that, but you're gonna say you're not guilty and you're gonna accept that plea deal and leave and get your freedom. I think we'd all take this. Guilty or not, I think we'd take it. I mean, nobody wants to be in jail. Now, what I find so interesting also is in accordance with the law, once you accept a plea like that, since it is both sides, then nobody's responsible for really the years that you've been in jail. Like a lot of times we see people in jail for decades and they get a payout from the state that eradicated that by accepting that plea deal, which is probably why the state went about it that way to, to cover the financial liability. Also, when it comes to testing DNA, and this is what's going on currently with the DNA that they have, you can't really test the DNA if there's no ongoing course, court case because you made a plea deal. So now we don't know who's guilty because the court says, yeah, we have no obligation to try this because you made a plea deal and you left the case, okay? So this case went in so many different directions. And they brought up the wording, and I blame Geraldo for this, but they brought up the wording satanic panic. That was a Geraldo thing, and if you all remember him, and I do because I was alive during the time that Mr. Mustache was out there blathering on TV, this guy was the talk show host. He was like out there. He was going to find out what was in Al Capone's tombstone, tomb, whatever, grave to dig up to find nothing. Like, he was an idiot, okay? But what they were actually doing was ushering in with Geraldo the beginning of reality TV. If you look back on it, it's the beginning of shock talk, you know, reality TV, what's real, what isn't. Remember Jerry Springer, who's your baby's daddy, all of that. So Geraldo's right at the cutting edge of that at that time. And he interviews the family and people and also people in the McMartin trial that was prior to that. And talking about devil worshiping, satanic panic, everybody thinks everything is satanic and evil, blah, blah, blah. And the Christian conservative town. So you can kind of go both ways with this. First of all, what was offensive to me about the entire thing is there are many religions and many people follow many different types of religions. I mean, there's so many out there, as you all know. But if you are a Christian and you're not a fundamentalist radical in whichever religion you're in, you're really not going to be threatened by satanic panic or Satanism or any other religion that goes against what you think because you believe in your religion and therefore you believe that you're protected. It's radical people that go around preaching like idiots and, you know, there's only one way and this and that and the other. Those are the people that cause the problem, not a town full of God-fearing people who just want to live their life and go to church on Sundays. That's ridiculous. Also, the same goes for the people that practice the Satanism. Just because you practice a religion that goes against God, which is Satanism is that, is the opposite, 
does not mean you're a murderer. Doesn't mean you're a murderer. Murder is a separate thing, and I believe that if you're in a religion that calls for murder and you participate, then that would kind of lead to a mental illness. Look at the camera's going crazy again. I'm going to turn it on and off and make sure that it stops doing that. Is it stopped? I love doing this. I'm just going to turn it on and off to see if it stops doing this. Okay, this video has driven me crazy. This is the seventh time I'm attempting it because the camera goes bananas. So hopefully this works. Anyway, being a practitioner in any kind of occult practice, occult means in secret, done in secret. It's not so much secret now in our time frame because they put they print astrology in the paper. Um, people are all on YouTube and all over the place giving readings, doing healings, using crystals, etc. And using references and meditations to bring in certain energies and asking certain deities for help. That's what you see a lot of. And if you want to look at it in a very kind of fair way. If you look at the Catholic Church and you look at the priests coming out and you look at mass and you look at the way that they wear their robes, they speak in Latin, they use incense and they do incantations and you speak in Latin or you repeat things in Latin and you do the rosary and you drink the blood and eat the body of Christ, you figure out what that means. So there are many a religion that use prayer and things in order to help get things done in their life, or it's a belief system. So you can have a belief system that is abhorrent, as I find Satanism abhorrent personally. However, it doesn't make you a murderer. So we have to look at that. Now, I'm going to tell you the three teenage boys and their birth dates. I have them written down here. I'm going to tell you about their astrological placements. Again, I do not have times of birth, so I do not know rising signs. So we have Damien Eccles, and he was the oldest at the time. He was 18, and he was born December 11th of 1974. And he had Sun in Sagittarius, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Neptune, and North Node in Sagittarius. That is a stellium if ever I heard one, and that is a predominance of Sagittarius energy. Somebody can be born a Sagittarius and only have one planet and not be a strong representation of that energy, but this is a strong representation. And the one thing about Sagittarius is they will explore every time of every kind of philosophical pursuit, theological belief system until they find the one that works for them. You can even find them testing out things as simple as different kinds of diets that work for them. So they could be vegan, they could be vegetarian, they could be carnivore, they can only eat lettuce. I mean, they go the gamut until they find what suits them personally. So you remember, their sign is the archer. So they reach for the skies, the unknownness to man. So that makes sense about him, that he would be schooled in things that most of his peer group would not be. He had Saturn retrograde in Cancer, and that's a huge mark for me, um, for him. He also had a Scorpio moon. Now, keep in mind, the moon is going full in the tail end of Libra and hitting Scorpio that night. And actually, the moon goes full about, I had it written down, I had to track it back to that time frame. I think it's about 1.34 a.m. in the morning. The moon on May 6th of 93, the moon goes full. So the energy leading up to where these boys are missing is actually ritualistically correct for that type of thing going on. So people often use moon phases to complete ritualistic things. And as we know in certain religions, and I'm going to just use Santeria because it's a common place in Los Angeles, they do things with animals, blood, etc. at certain times of the moon phases in order to accomplish certain energies. So that would be technically animal sacrifice. Not everybody, but I know some that do. So when we're looking at this, it's an interesting time frame for these boys to go missing. Also, if you want to look at it from a non-ritualistic point of view, the full moon is for releasing. So whatever was hidden comes to light and then is released. So it could just be off timing on that day. So we have Damien there. We also have a moon Mars connection with him. So emotionally, he's full of anger. 
That's fine. He's a teenager. Then we have Jason Baldwin. Jason Baldwin was the youngest of the bunch, being 16 years old, born April 11th of 1977. Moon in Aquarius, Mars in Pisces. Saturn in Leo. So he had a different Saturn sign. Pluto, Libra, North Node. What is interesting about him is he's an Aries, and in his family unit, he's given the chance to start a new life cycle. But he chooses, I guess, friendships. Granted, he was 16. I don't know what to say about that because as a former 16-year-old and you guys all being young, you kind of know you might not pick the best friends to hang out with. Anyway, this kid really got like nailed for his choices. And then we have Jesse Miss Kelly. Now, Jesse Miss Kelly is the one that started the rampage because he confessed to the crime. His birthday is June 10th of 1975, and he was the 17-year-old at the time. Sun and Mercury in Cancer, Saturn in Cancer. So the first thing I noticed with that is he's probably an alcoholic or probably was an alcoholic at the time. We have... Um, we have Pluto Libra North Node connection, and I believe he has a moon in Taurus, but I could be wrong about that. Um, I forget what I wrote with it. But Jesse Miss Kelly is interesting because they describe him as not having an IQ above a, cor a cardboard box, basically a functioning idiot. I'm going to disagree with that. I'm not a mental health expert, but... He's a cancer. Cancer absorbs energy and they're going to keep quiet till they feel safe. And they're only going to reveal a little bit at a time because that's how their energy operates. Now, what's interesting about him is this kid had a chance to recant his story. This has been since 93. Okay. He's had a chance to say, I didn't fucking do this. I made it up. I was crazy. I was drunk. I was high, whatever. He never goes publicly and says, I didn't do this. He is not like the other two. He continues and has continued to confess throughout the years. Continued, continued, continued. Now, here's the connection I get energetically. And this is interesting. I feel Jesse Miss Kelly and a female in his life, not a girlfriend, maybe someone who shouldn't have been having sex with him, but a female in his life, knows very full well what happened and why it happened. Because I feel like part of this was instigated by a female. And I feel like the female communicated with Jesse. And I'm going to tell you something else. I distinctly and very clearly see four boys in the woods. Okay, four boys in the woods. Not three, not the three dead boys. Four and not teenagers four eight-year-olds, maybe somebody was nine or seven, but four little kids approximately the same age. I also get very confused immediately as I'm focusing on this and as my camera's been going bananas in and out of focus and all of that, as it has, like I've tried all week to film this, but I'm instantly, if, when I ask who did this, and I am leaning, and let me just say this, before I started this video, I thought the Memphis Three were innocent, although with Damien Eccles, I have always believed there's attachments to him and not a possession like the exorcist because that is actually very rare, but there are attachments to his physical vessel. And when I watched in court, I clicked on something where he was in court and they asked him what he was writing on a piece of paper and it was like Sanskrit, that immediately made me know he dealt with demons, okay? That he called in entities, call it whatever you will, I, not necessarily, whatever they are on the other side, he called them in and he used that writing to access the channel. So what I saw after that, I went straight, boom, back like this with the energy and I saw three gargoyles. So winged gargoyles and they were sent after each of the boys. So what I am seeing is a ritualistic attack, but I don't actually think that that's what happened in the murder. Now, I'm even going to move this in a slightly different direction. So, I see four boys go into the woods. I don't know where the other kid is or who the hell it is, but I see four kids going into the woods. They're on their way to the woods. I see four kids. I also see two of the step parents, which should narrow down who the parents are, that were 
doing things in their own lives that they didn't want to get caught for. And so I feel along the lines of illicit sex acts, but not with women, okay, with men. I feel both these stepfathers were doing this and they may have been doing it together or separately. I also got very distinctly from the gargoyles that fly out, okay, and they block my sight. So when I say that, I'm kind of asking to see who did what and I the wings spread and they're like gargoyles, which are kind of like little dragon flying mythological creatures, I guess. Anyway, that's what I see. Now, I know that is magically sent out. In other words, if I'm seeing that now, that's covering what really happened. So there is still a cover on an energetic level to what really happened. So when I see that, I know that somebody was conjuring. I don't know who, but I know somebody was. I also feel that these three boys, and I'm going to go all the way back to Christopher Beyer popping out when I did the first video that got ruined, tape was missing. Christopher Beyer pops out and he's like, I'm telling, which means he saw something and he was finally going to tell somebody. That's why they were murdered. They, they didn't, whoever it was, did not want him telling other people about what those three boys saw. Christopher opened his mouth and said something, okay? There is a woman connected to it and there is a fourth boy somewhere. The fourth boy has to be in his 30s now because I think those kids would be in their 30s. They're born in 93. That would put them at 33 this year, coming up this year. So who is that fourth boy? That fourth boy is out there. There was also conversation about a guy running into one of the restaurants or the gas station and leaving blood all over the walls. And it was witnessed, oddly enough, by Jesse Miss Kelly's stepmother's son, who would be a boy around that age. So I'm wondering if that kid knows something. But he saw that man as well. And there were people that phoned the police after the fact. I feel people witnessed the murder that were not involved with the murder. Now, why the hell they didn't come forward? I can't. I, I have no explanation. I would have got out of town. I would have taken off in my car and then called after I saw that. Like I would have gotten far enough away. But I feel that Robin Hood Hills was used for a truck stop, sex stop kind of place for men in the neighborhood to do things like that and to discuss things and to hide things. And I do feel there was a higher level energetic thing going on in the town. So I feel one of the boys, and I'm going to go with Christopher Beyer, because that dad was so brutal to that kid in life, I feel that that family has a generational kind of curse against them. And by curse, I mean behavior, okay? Not like anybody threw a curse at them. But I feel they were involved in things, occult things going back. I feel more than one of those boys' families was, seriously. Or they thought they were, whatever. And I also feel that the three boys that went to jail, I feel one of them is responsible. So there's a connection to the step parents, one of the boys in jail. So we, we, we are like-minded and that is a beast system thing. The police are causing chaos. That is chaos magic. There is also glamor magic over Damien because he is the rising star of the bunch. If you want to say it, all the celebrities, they did their documentaries. All three boys, have credits as actors and producers in the documentaries, which I think is just appalling because there are three dead little boys that don't have the same kind of acclaim. Damien Eccles, I really feel, is connected to it. I feel it, okay, off of his energy. But the gargoyles kind of stand in the way. So still the truth is being blocked. There were so many different things going on at the time. There's the goofy behavior of um, Stevie Branch's stepfather cleaning the house, not looking for the boys, not telling his mom that he was missing. That's some fuckery right there. But I feel that these men reacted the way they did because they were hiding their own secrets, okay? So they were hiding something that made them look guilty because they didn't want to get found out. Now, Christopher Beyer was the one of the bunch that was found mutilated in the genital area and they have never found that part of his body or, you know, that kind of thing. And I am being told that it was taken as a 
what's the word I want to use for that? It was taken as a trophy. So that to me says that the boys were being stalked because Christopher Beyer came across something in his life and saw something. And those three boys knew about it. That's not, I mean, they're little kids, big deal. But somebody was afraid that he was going to tell. And I did see that immediately. I'm telling like this. And it's interesting because I got really confused between Christopher Beyer and Stevie Branch, which one of the little boy's face was showing up saying that. But I still think it's Christopher Beyer from the energy. So they saw something. And the reason that the, the gen genital area of the little boy was taken was as a trophy to what he saw. Okay. So they stripped away his manhood in theory. Whose manhood was he going to take away while he was alive? That their ego got hurt and they, they felt wounded and they had to stop him from saying, because he was going to tell somebody. Now, it could have been something completely random, but I'm going to pose that question again. Whose manhood was Christopher Beyer going to take away by speaking? I'm tell I'm telling who whose was it? That's the person who killed him. So this was an uh, um, an ego wound, not a ritual. Although there were ritualistic components to it, there's also insanity. There's also crazy ass behavior. And if you're going to look at it truthfully, is it not right out evil to kill three little boys? Like what the hell are you doing? What are you doing? Like why don't you just not do that? So that in itself is part of the beast system because the murder of children is against everybody's nature, except obviously the murderer. But it was egoic. It was an it was an ego bruise to the person that took his genital part of his body. Okay, I'm talking about Christopher Beyer. Also, I get this is just weird. I get other men in the neighborhood being able to spy on these three kids unbeknownst to these three kids which tell me that there were enemies in the neighborhood that had access to the kids like a general store you know where they would go and get soda ice cream whatever and could spy on them because where do kids go kids go to get candy kids go to buy magazines kids go to buy cards whatever anything like that these kids were being spied on okay spied on and I still feel I still feel that Jesse Miss Kelly is telling the truth as far as he knows it now what's interesting is they tried to distract because he's stupid they say and I don't think that that's actually the case I'm not saying he's like you know a Mensa member but I don't think he's as dumb as they describe and he spoke truthfully they wanted him to appear dumb as a distraction, chaos magic. And I see the magic going on here. So people are throwing the energy. That's why people fought to get them out of jail and took up their cause. I don't see them taking up cause for your relatives in a Chicago prison. Those kids missing. I mean, they're not doing it. If you see celebrity involved in a cause, ask yourself why. Because we know that they're part of the cabal. And so I feel that these murders were energetically charged in order to bring about and harness energy. I don't know who's doing it though. I'm not saying the people that killed those boys are the ones that are the practitioners. It's so chaotic around the energy and it still swirls and they don't want you to know who did it. But I've changed my mind since reading the energy. I do feel they did get some of the correct people in jail for the murders. I feel that now. I did not feel that before. So my opinion has changed from what I, what I felt. But there's still something I'm missing. And I feel, see, understand, when we're talking about, uh, you know, the cabal, Satanism, that kind of thing, or, uh, you know, Baphomet, religion, whatever you want to call it. When we're talking about it, you have to understand, just like if I'm going to use Catholic again as an example, because it's known traditionally, or Judaism, when you go into a town and 
you see a temple or a church and you're of that religion, you meet like-minded people who follow that doctrine in that church or temple. It's a way of identifying. Doesn't mean you know them personally. It just means that that chick goes to church, that guy goes to temple, and so do I. And therefore, we must think similar. That's how stupid human beings are, speaking of stupid. So when you're talking about the beast system, understand you have facets of people that know how to identify each other and behave and perform certain energy rituals in order to accomplish things and are of like-mindedness. And they can be in positions of power and they can be orchestrated from lower levels. Now understand, if somebody is practicing spells as a 13-year-old and they're smoking weed, drinking, do, dropping LSD, doing whatever the hell they're doing, they open themselves up to energy frequencies that they can attract um, attachments. And then they can be manipulated to do things because of what they hear in their head. Now, Damien Eccles has an extensive history as mentally ill, so they say, in a psych hospital, hearing voices, all kinds of things. Or were those the attachments telling him what to do? See, we don't know that. They call people schizophrenic and mentally ill, and sometimes it's not that at all. It's frequency switching that causes energies, entities, and outside interference within the context of your frequency in your body. Drugs, alcohol, um, sodomy ritual, which is involved in the Satanism aspect of that, so it's interesting, but... That is my first energy reading on the West Memphis Three. And once again, my name is Sloan from SloanBella.com.